for a fully managed account they're acting as principal but just on the on the wording of the provision you can see that there is room for debate on that issue to answer your question I can't name a case on on what the meaning of fully managed account is but as a practical matter if there is an investment discretion you usually view the account to be fully managed any other questions yes yes I'll let Priscilla answer that but I think what what the Commission looks for is an absolute as opposed to contingent exposure of 97,000 yes and it's a I'm sorry should I restate the question I keep forgetting the question is on to rely on the $97,000 exemption do you have to actually put up $97,000 or can you invest something less and then assume a liability the example given is by way of guarantee and in that case obviously a contingent liability and bring yourself within the exemption if the sum of the amount invested in the contingent liability meets the $97,000 test the Commission and the Commission staff would take the view and you can find it in policy 6.1 that you you can put up a small amount of the $97,000 in cash but the balance should be by a note an absolute liability or if you are assuming liability on a mortgage it has to be a personal individual covenant so and here is interesting the 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 increase in the exemption in the proposed amendments the Securities Act to $250,000 one of the abuses that that is intended to remedy is the abuse of a small investor who can put up $10,000 and a note for the balance which may be hopefully repaid out of cash flow from the investment and so he hopes he never in fact will have to pay the other $87,000 and and so the exemption is being used by the unsophisticated purchaser but you do have to have an absolute personal liability yes I'll repeat the question it involves joint investors seeking to rely on the $97,000 and the example is a husband and wife investing together a hundred thousand dollars are they eligible for the investment the issue of joint investors is dealt with in the policy and I'm not sure about husband and wife but I would think that would be considered two investors husband and wife you've hit upon a very difficult problem in view of increasing women's liberation and so on I think probably the Commission would accept a joint investment by a husband and wife as by one person on an informal basis it's up to you whether you think you can give an opinion that that's acceptable I think we wouldn't enforce any sanctions against that type of investment I think that I think that the key to that response is the informal basis I don't think it's there on the law and the regs the policy at all are there any other questions yes I 
I'll repeat the question and correct me if I, you don't think I have it to have, have it right. Um, the question is whether the solicitor acting for the issuer has an obligation to advise the purchaser of its contra of its contractual right of action and the necessity of, of having a specified or having net worth uh, sufficient to be able to assess the investment. And if you fail to advise the purchaser of those two things, is the solicitor for the issuer negligent? Is that, is that the right question? Um, well, I guess my first response would be if you're acting for the issuer, I'm not sure you have any obligations at all to the purchaser. Um, as a practical matter, um, if you are relying on an exemption that contemplates um, or requires that investors have sufficient net worth that they are able to assess the investment, you are either doing a, a government incentive security or a seed capital type placement. In one case, uh, an offering memorandum is mandatory, in the other it is 99 times out of 100 used, just because as a practical matter you can't do the deal without it. Uh, so in both cases your contractual right of action will be mandated by statute, it will be described in the offering memorandum, it will be set out in the subscription agreement. If there is no offering memorandum, there is no contractual right of action about which you need to advise, uh, if you do need to advise. Um, if the exemption you're seeking to rely on requires um, an investor with a significant net worth, you will have him make representations to that effect in the subscription agreement. So I guess what I'm saying is I don't really see why the uh, issuer solicitor would have um, a, any need to make uh, give advice to uh, the purchasers on either of those issues, and, and uh, uh, I don't think your obligations to them in any event. We are on our own for lunch today, I guess in the interests of uh, economy of scale. I would suggest for those that are unfamiliar with the area, um, to the north there's obviously the Holiday Inn in Chinatown. To the south you've got two major hotels, the Weston and the uh, Sheridan Centre. And then there's Simpsons, which has three places, and there's the Eaton Centre if you want to get involved in that mob. I would suggest we come back at 1.30 if that's acceptable so that we can get away a little earlier this afternoon. We'll come back at 1.30 and carry on. Well, we still maintained over half, I guess. Our next speaker is uh, Marlene Davidge. Marlene is with Tory Tory Delore in Binnington here in Toronto. I can attest to the fact that she concentrates her practice on securities law because for the first few years of my practice we were constantly opposite each other on deal after deal after deal. Marlene is going to talk to us about what is involved in going public and uh, while the focus of the morning so far and Frank will pick up again this afternoon and we'll talk a little bit about exemptions from prospectus. So far, we've focused on how to stay out of the Securities Act, and Marlene is going to talk to us a bit about the consequences of public going public and what it means. Marlene? Okay. Don Ross, when he asked me to do this topic, suggested since this uh, seminar was geared to the general practitioner that instead of focusing on how to do a, a um, public offering, I should focus on a question that sometime in your practice you're likely to get when your client who you've been acting for for some time phones you up and says, do you think it's time that I take my company public? And of course, um, one gets involved in the Securities Act in making that determination. You have to be very familiar with the provisions of the Securities Act, but you have to realize and truly understand the process that's going on to effectively advise your client as to what it means to go public and whether it's an appropriate decision for them to take at this time. For those who have not done a public offering before, let me just at first instance briefly describe the process. What I did um, at the end of my paper, you'll find an appendix that, show, that sets out 
the type of steps one goes through in doing a public offering, and you'll see that that sample uh, timetable does not purport to be exhaustive. Of course, it has to be tailored to your deal, but in every instance, responsive to the requirements of the statute, one must go through a minimum of, of a certain number of steps. The process is essentially that one must first prepare a preliminary prospectus, which the company and the underwriter and two individuals on behalf of the board of directors typically will sign. That prospectus is then filed with securities regulatory authorities in the provinces where it is proposed to offer the securities. Having done so, the Securities Commission then takes anywhere from three to six weeks to review your prospectus and give you your comments back. At, after settling such comments or what used to be called deficiencies in your prospectus, you then finalize those items and you file a final prospectus. It's only at that point that the underwriter can truly sell the securities offered by the prospectus during the period from while well, the preliminary prospectus has been filed till the final prospectus, the underwriter can solicit expressions of interest but cannot have anyone commit to purchase those securities at that time. The liability flowing from a prospectus document is a liability of the underwriter, of the company, of its directors, and in certain instances there are promoters or selling security holders involved. The liability stems around the magic words of whether your document contains full, true, and plain disclosure. And in connection with that liability, that liability can be discharged by the directors and the underwriters if they can show that they were duly diligent in preparing that document. And therefore, that is at the heart of the, the question of should I take my company public? There are a lot of things that look like innocuous items in, a, in the prospectus, which turn out to be things that one must fully understand in advising the client whether or not to go public. As a for instance, I've described to you the process in determining as, as to what goes in that document. There are forms at the back of the statute, Form 13 for an industrial company, Form, I think it's 14 for a natural resource company, Form 15 for a mutual fund company, and it lists the contents that must be included in your document. One of those items is a simple item that says, describe the business of the company. Now, in that sounds so simple, and there's a little description of instructions about you don't have to include descriptions of particular items of property um, that the company may hold or other little items. But the reality is that one statement represents a big undertaking on behalf of your, your client. He will be very typically, if this is the first time he has gone to the public market, he will be very uncertain as to how he should describe his business, and more likely, he will have almost a po possessive reaction to having to really describe his company in a meaningful way. The skeletons will have to come out of the closet, so to speak, including all his private little arrangements for payments, etc. And my typical experience with the small client is that it's he approaches the whole procedure as one of frustration and anger as to why do these people need to understand and know so much about my company? He's quite willing to describe the business in the sense that he manufactures newspaper or he manufactures jelly beans or whatever he manufactures, but what he doesn't want to, you to fully appreciate is the, the true nature of the risks and, uh, in engaging in that type of business. I don't know, maybe because I worked late last night, I decided to be frivolous and choose an example of jelly bean ink and, and what I would consider in trying to describe the, the business of Jelly Bean Inc. Obviously, let's assume that Jelly Bean Inc. is a company manufacturing candies for upscale baby boomers, and one, uh, so he's in the high-priced candy market. And one has to obviously look at things such as his major supply contracts. If the price of sugar is really going all to hell and it's going to gra gravely affect his margins on his pro products, you have to know about that and you have to understand that in trying to determine whether or not this com it is an appropriate time for this company to go public. Obviously the key question when a client raises the question as to whether he should go public is the urgency of the need for the money and secondly 
how much work he's done raising money in, from other sectors, um, such as the private placement sector that Jeannie has discussed this morning. The, the ramifications of going public are very important, and as I explained, typically the first-time issuer will have a very proprietary sense towards his company and is unused to having to owe an obligation to the public to describe what's going on and, and come clean with full, true, and plain disclosure. And not only that, it will occur not, not just at the time he goes public by filing his prospectus and getting his clearance, but it will be an ongoing obligation that is, he is assuming his company will become, within the meaning of the Act, a reporting issuer. The effect of that is found in various sections of the Act. It will involve filing of insider trading reports for any, any shareholder who holds more than 10 percent, filing of quarterly and annual financial statements, filing of material change reports. In other words, he must con keep the public marketplace fully aware of the effects on his company and what is happening in his company. His immediate temptation will be to try not to tell all, and, and it's through this process that the client looks to the lawyer to, quote, protect him. And in essence, what I find what myself doing is, in a sense, being on the other side of my own client, trying to get him to appreciate the nature of the liability he is assuming so that he will um, tell one about all that is happening in the context of his company. So let's come back to this general question of, is this a good time for an offering? First of all, of course, you look at the urgency of the need, which we've talked about a little bit, and whether he has examined other sources of raising capital. You also, as I discussed, have to be aware of existing non-recurring problems he's having in his business or future prospects of his company. That must be reviewed to see whether, obviously, to, to market securities of a particular company, a, a rosy picture is often the most desirable way of being able to be in a good situation to raise substantial capital. The big issuers such, a, such as a Dome Petroleum or a Massey Ferguson or an Inco who are having problems also do raise money through prospectuses and disclose all, all the problems they are having. But that would not um, be an offering that a small company is likely to get away with, especially if it's just a first time issuer. And I, I don't really mean that in a derogatory sense towards an Inco or a Massey. It's just that the marketplace is so unfamiliar with his company that the education process that it has to go through in the marketplace does not facilitate the document disclosing a business that's having significant problems. As discussed earlier, he will also incur liability on this document, and so it will involve a lot of expense, both in the sense of money and in the sense of time, of senior people involved in the business sitting down with the lawyers, the accountants, the underwriters, what is commonly known as the working group, to spend weeks literally preparing this document. One of the important questions that has to be reviewed is how many shares or how many securities are to be offered by this prospectus. Obviously, um, the amount needed will be fundamental to determining how many securities in terms of counting the number of securities. It really comes down to the question of the price per security that, that can be charged, and that will be largely determined by current market environment. Your client, unless he is in that business, is probably totally unaware of what the marketplace is now um, seeing as the sexy or hot item, something that can be sold. Common new issuers in the last two to three years have been high-tech companies such as the Mitels, the Nabus, et cetera. Now, those, those companies um, had a lot of interest in them, and therefore, it was easier to market those types of issues than, than issues of a small jelly bean ink when it's not perceived at that point as being a sexy item. However, there is a marketplace for those, those items. One has to contact and an underwriter who is specialized in the area of distributing securities of smaller companies that are not well known. And therefore, the need for an underwriter in this context is often extremely important. If, if it, the underwriting, um, as Jeannie described, I think, can be done either on a best efforts basis, which means really that the underwriter 
will offer on behalf of the client the securities, but the underwriter does not contractually commit himself to purchase those securities. He will simply go out and beat the bushes for um, investors, but if he fails to do so, he has no obligation, if he fails to come up with any investors, he has no obligations to the issuer in terms of the lack of the money being raised. Uh, the other type of underwriting is, is referred to as a firm underwriting where the issuer and the underwriter enter into a contract whereby the underwriter contractually commits himself to purchase the securities. And this is a very important context. It's the risk assumption of the underwriter that triggers the underwriter's interest very highly in the document, number one, um, constituting full, true, and plain disclosure, and secondly, being a decent marketing document. The, the frustrating thing that your client will face, assuming he can find an underwriter who is willing to help him in the distribution, is that he will have to incur substantial expenses without really knowing whether or not he is going to get into, a, to, he is going to be able to enter into that underwriting contract with the underwriter you'll find that your client is very surprised to find out after all of the examination of the business and whether he should be going public or not, he, his basic response is, where do I sign? And that's right at square one, the February 12th I've contemplated in the uh, timetable, or the February 1. He, the underwriting agreement itself is not signed up until the, typically the night before the prospectus goes final. By that time, your client has already incurred substantial legal fees, substantial printing fees, accounting fees, um, lots of, lots of the, his key employees' time by virtue of sitting around in rooms for weeks on end drafting these prospectuses. And the, all of these elements have to go in to assisting the client to understand what he's undertaking when he's deciding to go public. because. These are, there are substantial risk factors in even bringing a market, uh, an issue successfully to the market, and he may incur all these expenses for naught if the market goes sour between the time he undertook this project and the time he's really ready to go final. And believe you me, that's happened many a time. I can tell you when I've had to issue some bills that are quite high and the issue never got off the ground because I, from a legal point of view, one one has done an awful lot of work before one goes final with the prospectus. As I explained earlier, the, the underwriter is really an important factor for a small company. He is well aware of the marketplace can, and can provide um, si si significant expertise in, in making that determination of whether or not to go public at that time. Obviously, you can have the best company in the world, but if the marketplace is sour, nothing is going to get off the ground. If it's, let's say you wanted to do an equity offering and there was no real marketplace at that time, you're sort of wasting your money to go with, ahead with it at that time. And the people who are attuned are typically the underwriters. That's their whole job. In addition, he'll bring a lot of expertise to the drafting of the document and he will for example, typically pull out a lot of precedents of similar companies so that when you say to your client, go away and create the first draft of a description of the business of the company, he's got something to look at. I should tell you that typically one finds that the first draft that the client does for you on the description of his business is woefully inadequate and you'll then spend two more weeks kicking and screaming from him the the uh, information that one truly needs to describe the business of the company. And it is really quite a painful process and a tedious process as one goes through, but it is, as far as the Securities Commission is concerned, definitely a process that must be gone through. Under, understand that there's a lot of comfort level that comes from the fact of an underwriter being involved because he is assuming liability. It, it adds a comfort level to the marketplace that an independent party has been in there investigating and examining um, the, this particular company and, and these people are financial analysts and do a lot of background work on the competitors, et cetera, as part of the due diligence process of the underwriters, a part that really the lawyers aren't playing. The lawyers are obviously playing the legal due diligence process, but in understanding whether the price earnings ratio of this company is woefully offside what the industry average is. The, the role of the underwriter is indisputable in that process 
Indeed, there has been a case in the United States where you will see I've included a sample underwriting agreement at the end of the paper, and you'll see that there is typically an indemnity clause that the company agrees to indemnify the underwriter if the document did not con contain full, true, and plain disclosure. In the United States, um, there has been a case that has determined that 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 indemnity clause is unenforceable as it is against public policy. And the rationale, the public policy rationale, is that it undermines the Securities Act to allow the underwriter to have a complete indemnity as against the company. In other words, he wouldn't be doing his job that the remedial nature of the statute is geared at, that the underwriter would have liability and therefore would be an effective independent party going in and determining that this company is disclosing fully the affairs of the company. You will, however, find that the underwriter also, of course, has a keen interest in selling uh, the product and, and often wants to put in quite promotional type statements that, uh, in terms of trying to support those statements in a court of law, would be difficult to substantiate, so that the, the lawyer typically does play a legal role in that sense of toning down the marketing or promotional type statements that uh, both the company and the underwriter might otherwise want to include. Usually anything pointing to industry statistics or where industry is headed, the lawyer will request to see um, the survey, whether it be an independent survey of the industry on which that statement is based, because that will serve as a good basis of defense for the directors of the company. I should comment that the role of company counsel is not really just the role of company counsel. The other main people that you are protecting are the directors of that company who will suffer um, liability unless they can prove that there has been full, true, and plain disclosure. And if you go through the timetable, you'll see that there are various devices mentioned to help give comfort to those directors that the proper process has occurred. For example, there's reference to the um, circulation of a memorandum asking the officers to review, the officers who are involved in the particular areas of that business to review the prospectus to see if they believe that it does constitute full, true, and plain disclosure. You circulate the directors and officers for the personal information that is to be included in the prospectus relating to them. We also, as a standard practice, circulate to the directors a memorandum with their draft of the prospectus describing to them their very liability and the steps that have been gone through so that they will understand the process and what has been done on their behalf. I have rarely um, gone through a prospectus process where I haven't been asked to attend the board of directors meeting of the company so that the directors can look me in the eye and say, are you happy or do you think this is good disclosure? You know the facts. They are looking for comfort because they have really been external to the process for the most part until they get that first draft of the prospectus. Another practice in terms of trying to assure that adequate think time occurs is to make sure that that prospectus is circulated to the board of directors well in advance of that meeting so that they have had an adequate opportunity to read it and to question the appropriate officers regarding its contents if they feel uncertain about the way things are described in the document. In terms of, there is another aspect um, it's not just a question of going out and saying, Mr. Underwriter, underwrite my securities. In fact, I think if you ask the big underwriting houses, they get approaches, many approaches every week from a number of small companies to um, go ahead and underwrite their securities. Therefore, your company really has to understand that just as he, when he goes into a bank um, and he has to convince the banker to lend him money, he should be prepared to go to the underwriter and explain to him why his company is a good company to take to the public marketplace, why his company should be taken to the public marketplace over, over and above the five others that have walked through that underwriter's door. And remember, this is a risk process for the underwriter as far as a firm commitment basis. I don't know if you saw a piece in the paper just recently, but it was about Xerox, which had gone to the public marketplace, and the underwriters had done a firm underwriting, and the underwriters took a bath which means that uh, basically the whole game of underwriting is they want to have sold the securities the second they have bought them so that they are, they are not having to finance the money that they are um, 
have committed themselves to pay to the issuer. That's their whole game. If they can sell it right away, then the fee that they are charging is basically their fee to the extent that uh, they can't turn around those securities and basically have to carry them through financing, they are losing money. And, and what happened, according to the newspaper reports, was that the market softened after the underwriting agreement had been, had been signed up, and the underwriters had to close that deal. They had no out. The prospectus was a proper document, and they were unable to sell in large volumes the amount they had committed to pay to the issuer. So in essence, the distribution process was going to take them a much longer time, and therefore the fee that they made, whether it was 5% or whatever, got totally eaten away with financing costs. And not only that, got more than totally eaten away, it was also turned into a huge loss for them. So that will give you a feeling of how strongly the underwriters are reviewing the company to see if they there is really a marketplace out there for that type of company, and also understanding the dynamics of the marketplace at the particular time. The, uh, the sample underwriting agreement um, does evidence the typical out clauses that an underwriter will have in those situations. But the, uh, the, the common out clause, the, the market all going all to hell sort of clause, is, has only been used, as it is my understanding, twice in history. Once it wasn't officially used, but it was uh, mutually agreed as between the company and the underwriter that it wasn't a good idea to proceed. One was on the announcement of the Second World War, and the, the other one was the Israeli, the Arab-Israeli War. In, in, in the latter case, the company agreed that it was, wasn't going to hold the underwriter to its obligations. But things like this really do happen, and major shifts of interest rates can dynamically affect that underwriting marketplace. So the underwriter, in terms of reviewing your company, basically my understanding of the best way to do it is almost the same way that you, you um, do with your banker. You go in and you have a good description of the operating results over the last 10 years of your company. If your company is showing a terrific up, upward trend, obviously they're going to be um, much more interest. they're interested. They're going to look at growth in sales and earnings. They'll do a, the underwriter themselves will already spend a lot of time reviewing the industry in general and understanding where this company fits in in terms of the industry in general. It, it will look for um, potential problems on the horizon or existing problems such as major labor disputes, um, major changes in the regulatory environment affecting this company any number of things before the decision will be made that they will underwrite the company. The, uh, in terms of, we've, we've discussed a little bit about the pricing of, of the sale of securities and also, of course, another very relevant factor is what type of securities are to be offered. Typically, for the small company going to the public marketplace, it is an equity offering. So your client has to understand that, first of all, his own voting interest in his company will be diluted by this public offering, and that will go hand in hand with determining how large an offering the company is going to do. In other words, is the controlling shareholder willing to go down to below 50% of the votes? It most likely will be necessary to do a recapitalization of the company before taking it public. For example, there may only be 10 common shares outstanding, all held by your client, but those 10 common shares are worth Let's, to take the ridiculous $10 million, and therefore a substantial split in the common shares will have to occur if you want to offer the common shares in the public marketplace at $10 a share or something along those lines. Your client may have used that company as an estate freeze mechanism, and obviously you should get the estate freeze mechanism out of that company and up into a holding company and that is not appropriate for a public um, company. Uh, there may be f very funny preferred shares hanging around, preferred shares with a right to a uh, set amount of dividends plus such additional amount as the directors determine. Obviously, a common shareholder is not too happy seeing a class of preferred shares above them who have a, an unlimited right at the discretion of the directors to more money be in priority to the common shareholders. The common shareholders want to know that they have the true equity position. The um, in terms of the underwriting discount involved, you, having described to you the risk that the underwriter is taking, you can now start to appreciate why underwriting discounts are 5% or 
whatever the, the magic number is. Obviously, with the first-time issuer who is not well known in the public marketplace will end up paying more, especially on an equity issue. The first time through the hoops is obviously the hardest time, but what it will, the advantage of a public offering is that the knowledge in the public marketplace about that company will significantly increase such that um, in the future such things as rights offerings, uh, pre preferred share offerings, debt offerings will be greatly enhanced. Obviously, if you do an equity offering, then it is likely that the debt to equity ratio of the company will substantially improve, thereby facilitating a debt offering in the future. In terms of the expenses involved, I think I started to describe to you some of them, and they can be substantial. For those who haven't been involved, one of the key lines to look at on the front page of the prospectus, you will see um, there's a breakdown between gross amount received on per security and then net amount, which is reflective only of the underwriting discount. So you'll see typically that it'll say uh, gross amount $10, the actual amount raised on behalf of the issuer, let's say $9.50. But then there's always a magic little note, and if you look in the little note, you will see that the other expenses of the issue are estimated at, and it is very frequent to see a number around $250,000 put in that that uh, bullet. And that, believe you me, is only an estimate because if you end up with significant long discussions with the Securities Commission so that you're eating up uh, uh, the time of legal advisors or the time of the accountants, that fee can greatly increase. Um, it's very important to be aware of the rules of the Securities Act relating to financial statements that must be included in a document. The first time issuer would, would probably, because the size of the issue is likely to be small and the expenses are fixed, nevertheless, he is, he's, more, he's well advised to do his offering um, after his year-end financial statements have been prepared instead of next no November when a new set of financial statements which aren't typically audited uh, would have to be audited and significantly increasing the fees of the um, accountants involved. The printing fees can be horrendous depending on the number of drafts you go through. With the modern technology now, it's very common to see that the prospectus document is kept on the law firm's uh, word processor until a, a good draft has really been created such that it then goes at that point to the printing house and then uh, you start incurring the expenses of each change around. To, to show you the degree of care that's taken, it's uh, as every one of us on this panel, I'm sure, have been through. You spend your night at the printer's proofreading that prospectus before it goes out the door, and it can be a pretty painful and late hour when that gets done. And all of this represents a legal cost, represents expenses to your client. And the other very important point, once again, is to understand that when you embark on this process, there is no certainty that when it comes time to go final, that marketplace will be a good marketplace and that the issue can go, uh, can go ahead. In addition, the pricing, in addition to the underwriting agreement not being signed up in general sense until the, the eve before you go final, the real reason for, for not doing that is you can't possibly price the issue until you're ready to actually sell the securities. Therefore, you might have embarked uh, on the process at a time when equity securities of small companies were typically capable of being sold at $10 a share and now it's $7.50. So you have to offer that many more securities to raise the set, same net proceeds as the company was, real, it was initially after and thereby, of course, diluting even further the voting control of your client in his company. In terms of how long the process will take, I think that's the other huge shock factor for the first time small issuer. He is, uh, once he's gone through it and made the decision that he is going to go ahead, he will, all he knows is he wants his money and he wants to carry on his business in the normal course. In fact, typically one will sp spend at least four weeks getting in shape a good preliminary prospectus to um, filed with the Securities Commissions, one will wait another four to six weeks to clear that prospectus, and then depending on, on the market dynamics at the time, one will either close um, from seven, anywhere from seven days after one's gone final to 30 days, 40 days at, thereafter. I think the rule is six weeks, is it not, Priscilla, that one must close your deal so that 
the time span is at, is typically around three months from start to finish, and all the during that whole period, except for when one goes final, there is uh, no certainty that the deal is going to go ahead. The having completed the uh, process of becoming a reporting issuer, you will find that your client will still be at your door for the next two to three months, sorting out what his obligations are and where he's headed. I always recommend that in addition to sending the typical closing book that one needs to send relating to any transaction, that a good reporting letter be given to your client. This is especially true if the offering has occurred in a number of jurisdictions because each Securities Act has their own set of rules. A common difference between the Ontario Act and the Quebec Act, for example, is that the uh, Quarterly financial statements must be filed 45 days after the quarter has ended, and a lot of clients, of course, react uh, that this just can't be done, but in fact they have, by going public, bound themselves into this situation, and the, the Quebec Securities Commission hasn't been too lenient on uh, people being let out of this timely obligation. I think um, that's really all I'm going to say about the, the going public process. There's a lot more detail in my paper, and, and I think what's important is to examine the underwriting contract. That is only a sample underwriting contract. It can be uh, varied from, from underwriting house to underwriting house. You will see, I, I mentioned earlier about uh, the non-enforceability on public policy basis in the United States of the indemnity agreement in, a, in a, uh, an underwriting agreement, and for that reason, it's common to see now that there is a contractual contribution clause that clicks in in the event that the indemnity uh, is found to be unenforceable. The, I guess the feeling is that a contribution clause as opposed to a, an indemnity is enforceable for public policy reasons, notwithstanding the policy of the statute because there is a reference to contribution, the judge determining con relative contribution between the two parties in the act. Are there any questions? Yes? Okay, I'll repeat the question. The question was, what is the minimum size um, that's feasible in terms of doing a public offering given the expenses involved? I, I mentioned in my paper, and that was based on just a quick review of recent prospectuses, that it's rare to see one that's below $10 million. There are special circumstances and there are special underwriters, but it is rare to see one anywhere below it. It's now becoming the common figure for the big issuers are, are $100 million plus these days. It's really increased substantially since I started practicing five years ago. Any other questions? Okay. Um, just a couple of comments that on, on the underwriting agreement. Um, uh, Marlene talked about the discount at which um, uh, the securities are are sold to the underwriter. You'll see in in the draft under or precedent underwriting agreement that she has provided that the uh, clause dealing with the fee. Um, outlines a number of services for which the underwriter is supposed to have performed for which the fee is being paid. And uh, that provision is in there uh, primarily to bolster uh, what will undoubtedly be the issuer's uh, uh, position regarding the, the tax treatment of that discount. Um, ideally, the discount uh, isn't a discount at all. It's a fee. Uh, which uh, is uh, the issuer is able to uh, write off on a current basis in the year in which the deal is done. And uh, uh, national revenue has been all over the map on, on this particular issue, but at the moment uh, for uh, regular issuer, issuers uh, paying what is considered the going rate in a normal underwriting, I think as an administrative matter, uh, are probably able to write off the fee uh, in its entirety in the year in which it is incurred, um, but the the underwriting agreement should have all those provisions in it that Marlene's got that 
basically uh, uh, try and set up the fee as a fee for services rendered as opposed to a fee being paid or a, a discount being granted for risk assumed. Um, if you actually look at the law on the issue, the key case is a, a case involving Royal Trust. It's about a 1982 or 83 case uh, in the Federal Court of Appeal. And uh, I, the administrative, the current administrative practice uh, in the department is uh, more liberal than that case would uh, actually warrant, or indeed the, the act would actually warrant. But I just caution you to leave the underwriting agreement on the fee structure as she's got it, because it's, it's structured that way for a very good reason. I'd like to um, qualify something that, that Marlene said about timing with the Securities Commission. Um, I am concerned that uh, Marlene may have been a trifle optimistic, uh, and uh, <laughs> I feel it's only fair to point out with small issuers or with new issuers, as opposed to the senior issuers, probably four to six weeks is, is optimistic. You, you, um, you might encounter difficulties uh, with your directors and officers, perhaps someone has a, uh, some sort of uh, stain on his character and, and there might be some subtle pressures to remove the person. Uh, you might find yourself negotiating uh, an escrow agreement and you'll find your client uh, who holds a controlling interest in his company who wants to go public is not at all pleased with having his shares tied up. Uh, that all takes time to negotiate. Uh, you, uh, you might find, if, if you're dealing with a, a junior resource company, that there is some problem with the engineering reports. And if there is a snag, if things don't go smoothly, it can certainly take longer than, uh, than four to six weeks. This actually works out perfectly, because having now scared everyone to death, and all of us that have done one of those, uh, it can take up, we, we spent a year with the OSC on one particular one. It's not their fault. They I thought they were just being horrendous at the time. They were right. Uh, this particular issuer didn't pay our account and uh, <laughs> went bankrupt right after the fact. Uh, so it turns out that it was, uh, that their more prudent and cautious view was correct. Uh, but it can be a very long and uh, frustrating experience. Having talked all, of, all about that now, perhaps we can go back and try and find some ways not to do that. Uh, Frank Allen is now with us, and he's going to uh, speak a little bit about uh, the exemptions from the registration and the prospectus requirement. Frank is with Osler, Hoskin, and Harcourt here in Toronto, and is another one of those people who have spent time with the Ontario Securities Commission, learning the ways and the ins and outs. And uh, Frank, if I can ask you to talk about exemptions.